Did you know that millennials represent the largest cohort of people over the age of 21, but the lowest number of wine drinkers? Why is that? Tonight on SIP episode 142, we have a brand and marketing expert to dive into that question. And for the wineries out there, you're going to want to pay attention. SIP episode 142 begins now. Uh, lots of folks coming on. My name is Martin Cody, co-founder of Cellar Angels, a direct-to-consumer wine company that was founded in 2010 to bring you the best wines coming out of Napa and Sonoma right now. These are limited production wines. You will not find them in stores. And there is a lot to talk about with regards to Napa and Sonoma this evening, specifically about a group of constituents known as millennials. But we're going to get to that in a second. Uh, I do want to point out the SIP kit. Many of you are buying these. This is the quickest way to get a sample kit, if you will, of some of the best wines coming out of Napa and Sonoma right now. And I want to point out that there's three bottles of wine from the same grape made by James and Lorenza from Accenti. And it's going to be an awesome discussion in a couple of weeks about the co-fermentation process as we get geeky. Uh, but they source from all these small, beautiful, regenerative vineyards that uh, they have identified. And it's going to be a fun event. One thing to know that the average bottle price in Napa in 2022 was $107. So we're going to talk about the expense of Napa and Sonoma, but there is not a single bottle of Napa wine on the Cellar Angels website right now above $85. So when you want to beat the Napa prices, come to the Cellar Angels because this isn't for the big boys. This is for the limited production wineries. Uh, the cohort that we're going to talk about this evening is the Millennials. And it is a cohort that seemingly has been largely ignored by the wine industry, specifically Napa and Sonoma. And we have an unbelievably knowledgeable person on this cohort, on wine itself and the industry. And by the way, we're featuring industry experts for the next several weeks because all of the winemakers are in the vineyards. Some of the red grapes are starting to come in. Most are two to three weeks out. So we hope the weather holds. It's a very late harvest this year for Napa and Sonoma. But we are delighted to have actually a friend of the program, friend of the company, and if you have, like many people, enjoyed the beautiful, luxurious, sophisticated, elegant color, branding, tone, voice of the Cellar Angels website, you have this next young lady to thank for it and her team. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Scout Driscoll of Design Scout. Scout, join us, please. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. And Scout is coming to us from her studio in Chicago. So cheers to a former Chicago, or a fellow Chicagoan. I'm the <laughs> former Chicagoan. Um, yes, thank cheers. You. I'm going to have a little sip of this. Happy Friday, everyone. Happy Friday, indeed. Now, Scout, I can't actually remember, this is probably at least three years ago or longer, someone referred us to you and uh, we were very, very impressed with your your background and your expertise, specifically from the design, but more importantly, some of the brands and labels that you've designed for. So do all of us a favor and kind of bring everybody up to speed on who you are, how you got into this crazy wine business, and, and tell us a little bit about the business that you've built. Thank you, Martin. So um, you might be wondering, what is a wine designer doing in Chicago? And so there's a story behind that. Um, so Vint is the wine and spirits division of my broader design studio, Design Scout, which I started 20 years ago here in Chicago. I was a baby in diapers. <laughs> and um, our largest client for the last decade by far has been Cooper's Hawk Winery and Restaurants. So if any of you are familiar in the chat or watching today, Cooper's Hawk is amazing. It's the largest wine club in, the, I think now the world. It's like 550,000 wine club members get their wine every month. And we have the pleasure of not only stewarding the overarching brand, but designing most of their monthly bottles of wine. Uh, and through Cooper's Hawk, we've had the opportunity to collaborate with folks like the amazing Dr. Lawson Riesling, John Charles Boisset, and six or seven different wines we've done with him and his wineries and vineyards. Uh, we've also worked with folks like John Legend over my shoulder here. I call this label, Why is John Sad? 
<laughs> anyway, um, and independent wineries coast to coast. So um, what happened is we began to reach out beyond Cooper Talk, and we have really developed an amazing network of folks within the wine world that we work with to not just develop beautiful labels, but really build brand. Uh, a lot of the wine industry, you know, is kind of stuck in the past and they think that your brand is your label. Uh, but we work with them to bring our insights from our 20 years of other industries like food and beverage, fast casual restaurants, coffee, craft beer, you name it, uh, to really teach them how to think about brand beyond your product. It's really about how you make people feel. So we offer a lot of brand strategy work, messaging and positioning work. And then of course, the whole outfit that each brand wears. Well, and I think that's, we're going to pull on a couple of those threads right there, especially the one that you said, it re it's really important how you make people feel. And yeah. I, I think that gets into, you know, a lot of what we're going to talk about with millennials and certainly uh, Gen Z uh, boomers. And I think it'd be helpful so we can have a level set aspect of definitions and terminology and cohorts. I'm going to share a deck and we can kind of start at the beginning, if you will. Now, in doing research for this evening's show, I, I was dumbfounded by a couple of things. And hopefully some of the smarter people can enlighten me as to some explanations for things. So first, let's look at the defining age groups. And so you can see that the greatest generation was born in 1901 to 1924. Uh, what I find interesting is, okay, this is 23 years. This is 20 years. This is less. This is 19. This is 14, 14 and what I don't know, and I didn't research, does anybody know why these blocks of time fluctuate? I'm curious about that. Uh, why is 114 and why 125? Uh, it seems, seems unfair. We're also going to be talking about uh, millennials and Gen Z. Keep in mind, half of the Gen Zs aren't even 21 yet. So we we had Judd Wallenbrock on a couple of weeks back and He's indicating that he, after 40 years in the wine industry, this is one of the most exciting blocks he's looking forward to. When these people start coming up of age, he thinks there's going to be a tremendous influence. So we're talking about millennials born 1980 to 1994, you know, only 14 years. Scott, I'm not going to ask you which group you fall into. because that would be weird. Oh, I'm proudly the last year of Gen X. Well, technically, okay. yeah. Yeah. So I'm that 1979 baby. My husband's and Gen Y or millennial, so um, I'm obviously better than him. And obviously, and I'm one of the first years of Gen X, so I'm a 66 baby. Yeah. So the population percentage of these groups, so you can see as a percent of population, the silent generation and uh, seller angels, we have got to stop marketing to these folks. They're declining and there's only 5% of the population. <laughs> so let, we need, need to change some of our messaging. But it's pretty even across the board. Uh, you know, 20 to 21% of the population are represented by the boomers, Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z. Then when you start moving on to behaviors and populations and in, in the millions and, and break down by gender, uh, as I said, Gen Z is a very, very big group. And half of them aren't even 21 yet. And it, we aren't even up to 2012. The millennials also very large in millions of people. So when you look at the ages down here and you can see how many millions there are, Gen Xers of uh, median age of 49, boomers uh, getting to decline. And then here's that somewhere in the middle of here from, from 60 on, this is the group buying the most wine in terms of percentage growth, which is fascinating. Now, the other thing that's fascinating is who's growing. And again, We've got to start hitting some senior citizen homes and some retirement centers at Cellar Angels because the 80 plus group is buying a lot of wine. Uh, 70 to 80 is up six and a half percent since I think 2007. 60 to 70 up five and a half percent. But what's fascinating to me and, and marketers and a lot of the wine industry have been missing this is the declining trend of the younger ages. So when you look at, here's the, the great way Silicon Valley Bank, and it's, this is all information from SVB's State of the Wine Industry Report, which is what we refer to in the industry as the Bible of wine data. Good news is greater than 60 is growing. Bad news is less than 60 is dropping share. And that's a really bad news because it hits twice because they're the largest percentage of, of population and the over 60 is, is declining. So what would you most likely bring to share at a party? This is my, my generation and my parents' generation 
are over here, 65 and plus, almost half of them would bring wine. And then when you move to the next cohort down, you drop by 20% in mind share. I mean, it's incredible to go from 49 to 29 to the next group. Stays pretty you know, stable from each group on what they're going to bring. But look at the 21 to 34 year olds. Yeah. Wine look is at, actually the- Sorry to interrupt. Look at the jump in hard seltzer. Correct. Look at the jump, you know, RTDs is relatively similar, but it's those spirits and it's those hard seltzers. Yep. And that flavored malt beverage. Are we all drinking Colt 45 or what? I, I actually had to Google what flavored malt beverage was. I'm like, is that Mickey's Big Mouth? Is that the Colt 45? That was what it was in my day. <laughs> I know. But I am, I'm fascinated that wine is now taking fourth place for what you bring to a party. Um, yeah. It's, that's interesting. And then last but not least, I do want to say that we have a new wine club member and this library club member is a millennial. So uh, this was late breaking news today. I'm not saying it's Taylor Swift. That's just a picture of Taylor Swift. I'm saying we have a new millennial wine club member. This is just like when you put uh, fresh farms on your product label and the product has nothing to do with being fresh or a farm. So uh, bear with me on that, but we did get a library club member today. So Scout, let's talk about these numbers. Yeah. Specifically the Seller Angels clientele. Uh, well, first of all, the playground we play in, as you know, is Napa and Sonoma. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Chad Angelo recently sent me today, he's a winemaker in Napa, an article from Wine Enthusiast that said... The average bottle price in Napa in 2022 was $107, and the average tasting fee in Napa last year was $81. So now, is Napa missing the boat on the demographic of the millennial just based upon the prices that they're charging? I would say so. It's so hard to encourage experimentation unless you have a service like Seller Angels. But at those price points, you really don't have the opportunity to have that. It's a, it's a big barrier to entry, I think, for younger people. And it's interesting because I think there is a generational perception of wine. And, and you and I are in the exact same group, mm -hmm. uh, but on different ends of that spectrum, if you will. And, and I grew up with regards to there was three things to drink. It was wine, beer, and then spirits. There were no ciders. There was no carbonated beverages. There was no craft cocktails. There was no RTD. No one knew what ready to drink cocktails were. Yeah. What was it like when you were growing up, you know, 19, 20 years later? Yeah, I think it was really similar. You know, I certainly, I was much more focused on spirits in my early 20s. You know, I, I did the cheap beer and then I, I personally jumped straight to Scotch on the Rocks. <laughs> Because I had a lot to prove, apparently. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there was a lot, there was, a, 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 I mean, a lot of the same thing. I didn't get a lot of uh, different options. I think things like the flavored seltzers and ready to drink cocktails were not something or part of the picture. And certainly now, I think even now as a younger Gen X, I must get like a Zennial, I'm kind of right in between. Um, a lot of my cohort are actually switching to cannabis. So we haven't even talked about the cannabis part of the conversation yet. And it's legal in Illinois where I live. Um, but it is, it is a huge part of how people are avoiding things that they consider unhealthy. You know, they, they think of cannabis as cleaner, easier, less hangover. You're not so tired the next day, um, natural quote unquote. So that's, that's part of the calculation as well. That's incredible. Cause that was always a no, no growing up because it wasn't legal. Um, and yeah. you had to just steal it from your older brother, but that's what I heard anyways. I, I never would have <laughs> done that. Well, like micro dosing is a thing now you can have half a gummy you know and I, I personally i'm not just for the record i really despise cannabis but everyone i know is is that's their co-enjoyment and so when they do drink they're not drinking as much and they're not drinking you know they might have one quality drink but they're going to have one instead of four or five or six throughout the night because they're co-enjoying with cannabis interesting i never even factored in the cannabis thing it's it's actually anecdotally related to, we had Lindsay Hoops on about three or four weeks ago, and she's helping kind of fight uh, Sonoma, I'm sorry, Napa County with regards to some ordinances to allow smaller wineries to have visitation. But she made the comment, and it was interesting that she said, we've always been pro-agriculture in Napa. And if we are really going to be pro-agriculture, we should be embracing cannabis. It's far more profitable from a standpoint of than grape growing. And I thought, well, that would be an interesting transition for the industry in Napa to become yeah. cannabis growers. 
uh, a whole new industry could be developing. Yeah. So the the perception of wine, and, and it's funny because I worked at a private country club. So this perception was alive and well when I was growing up with regards to the stodgy, old, white, fastidious individual who was snobbish, boorish, mm -hmm. uh, was into wine. I think personally that that has actually followed the wine industry for a while. And and what do you think on that? Yeah, I mean the the concept of the sommelier with their lapel pin and you know the wine list and and oh my gosh, how do I hold the bottle or how do I look at the cork or how do I take you know how do I prove the wine? Like there's so much formality in wine, and and that is something I think is a huge turnoff to younger millennials and especially folks that are just not familiar with the wine world and like the other eighty five percent of people who aren't bringing it to a party. Well, so do you think? Because every, every specialty, whether it's medicine, law, music, art, uh, real estate, it, architecture, they all have their own language. And, and you might be able to understand it at a 50,000 foot level, but until you start learning some of the vernacular, you, you kind of stay on the periphery. I, I think wine is somewhat similar. So how do you bridge or balance the need to get you know, a little bit of knowledge so that you can appreciate more of what you're learning without having it be so off-putting and so I, I, demeaning might be too strong. But I, I do think for a long time, the wine industry made people feel inferior since they didn't know about wine and, and all that formality. So how, how does a winery strike a balance so that they can have a millennial feel like they can be part of this brand? Yeah, I almost go so far as to calling the knowledge and the jargon gatekeeping. You know, there's a lot of, if you're, if you know, you know, and if you don't, you are inferior to appreciate this fine substance. Um, I will say though, there are a couple of wineries I think are doing a great job. One, not because they pay me, but Cooper's Hawk has done so much to add accessibility to wine, to bring wine. And if you don't know Cooper's Hawk, they are not past Scottsdale. Like they're really a Midwest, Florida, East Coast kind of brand. They've got a couple stores in Arizona, um, but they have brought that Napa style tasting experience without the pretension all the way across the United States to affluent suburbs everywhere. Uh, it's really ubiquitous. Everyone's mother-in-law is a member of Cooper's Hawk, uh, or at least 550,000 mother-in-laws. I was going to say about 800,000 mother-in-laws are members of Cooper's Hawk. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I like, and, and a lot of young people too, they, they really have spanned, you know, they, they attract a very diverse crowd by age, ethnicity, socioeconomic status. To some people, it is a like Friday night, best day of the year to other people. It's their Wednesday afternoon. Like they really do a great job of making it super accessible. Their uh, master psalm is Emily Wines, who is the chair of the court master sommeliers. And so she, if you know her, for those of you familiar with Emily Wines, she is so vivacious and fun. She wears these drinking suits, so like basically like men's suits covered in pattern and florals and super fun. Her hair is up to the sky and she's just a pistol. So like wineries are, are really willing to understand that this is an experience driven buying choice for millennials versus a access buying choice, which is something that a lot of boomers feel. You know, boomers enjoy wine because it is a status symbol in some ways. If they're educated, that education is a status symbol, being able to say what you know about wine. Um, but I really think there's a lot of opportunity to, to demystify wine. And so Cooper's Talk is doing that very well. There's a new wine club called Vinalia and they're doing a great job. They source grapes from, they're kind of the opposite of you guys. They source grapes from everywhere, but Napa and Sonoma. And they're bringing these wines, like their, their whole thing is there's like, I, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but for example, it's like, there are like most grapes are made from like five or most wines are made from like five or six types of grape. And there are 80,000 grapes. We're never going to give you a Merlot. And so they are helping people really have that journey of discovery and making their brand about that concept of discovery um, on a global level, sourcing from really tiny producers. And so, so that's a great opportunity. And then I have to give a shout out to my favorite winery, which is Tank Garage in Calistoga. And they are like the punk rock counterculture winery out of Napa that's doing some really cool stuff. And they sell out every single wine they produce. So I like, like it. Love them. It's, well, the funny thing is, is that you talk about experiential wine and, yeah. and, and Tank, is, Tank is an example of that. Cooper's Hawk is an example of that. How do you, or what, would resonate with millennials from an experience standpoint. And Scott, I would like Scout to kind of answer that, you know, define experience. And then some of the millennials that are uh, in the chat, feel free to write any type of experiences that you've had in wine 
because I think Cooper's Hawk is a bricks and mortar restaurant experience. Yeah. Uh, they have demystified a lot of the wine approach. There's also online experiences. There's uh, experiences in wine and, you know, in the Valley, in Napa and Sonoma or at the winery. And so there's different types of experiences. Some producers do it very, very well. Some do it horribly. Mm -hmm. What is the experience that the millennial is looking for? Yeah. I mean, so the way we think of brand to roll it back, just like a half step first, mm -hmm. the whole concept of brand is for someone in the blink of an eye to look at or experience what you're selling, no matter what it is and go, Oh, that's for me. You know, we talk a lot about like Harley Davidson, right? Like Harley Davidson doesn't sell high torque motorcycles. They sell freedom. And freedom appeals to every white collar worker, every blue collar worker. It is a universal thing we all love. And so when wineries make that experience about a feeling that that connects on a lifestyle level with a person and truly like it's, we talk about millennials, we put these monikers or these psychographics, demographics, but people are whole humans. Like we all have things happening in our lives. I've got two kids back home. I just shoved dominoes in my mouth because I had to rush here. I'm like, wow, fine wine and the cheapest pizza in the world. <laughs> you know, like we are whole people. And so when you, when you work on that experience, you have to think about the lifestyle of who you're connecting with. Um, so that experience might be what's happening at your tasting room. We were talking a couple of days ago, Martin, about John Charles Boisset and like how much he does for like photo ops within his wineries and how it's all about sharing that experience online. That's a huge, huge benefit and need for connecting with younger consumers. Our age just want to, you know, Pixar didn't happen. They want to show exactly what they did. It's all about showing other people that you have had this experience. Um, other things are, you know, like making sure that you have wines that are fascinating, educational, interesting, that you're learning something like you guys do with Cellar Angels. Um, that's another kind of experience, but you're always adding and enhancing to someone's lifestyle. You're meeting them in, as part of a whole human life and giving them something that makes them say, yeah, that's for me. I'm the kind of person that that's for. I think it's interesting. You're, you're spot on correct with regards to the experience aspect. And now when I, when I juxtapose that to some of the stodgy Gen Xers or boomers and, and their pictures on their social medias with the domain Romana Conti, with the Harlins, with mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit like that, but they're trying to say and boast that, Hey, I, I have my picture pride with this very rare bottle that you minions would never have access to. So it's still an experience. It's just more of that elitist type of experience that, yeah. that they are gravitating towards. Yeah. Well, of course, I mean, everything's an experience, but it, it's about status, right? Like the older jump is if you can afford this $225 bottle of wine, sharing an image of that enhances your status with your clients, with your customers, with your colleagues, you know, whoever. Um, but for millennials, it's, it, what's more important is things like having a well-rounded lifestyle, you know, it, travel, having the experience of um, being open-minded. You know, I saw someone mention something about, you know, sustainability in the chat. Like we haven't even gotten to that yet, but that's another, one of the things I think that the industry needs to do. Well, pull on that thread a little bit. What do you mean by sustainability and, and why does that resonate with millennials or Gen Z? Yeah, I mean, in, in general, it is a huge deciding factor for especially Gen Z, definitely millennials. Um, connecting with products that have a sustainability focus that are looking to actually improve the state of our environment. Uh, it's a huge, huge value and it has a ton of buying power. Everyone wants to get as many organic, natural, you know, perceived better for you things. You know, so when they see terms like, um, oh my gosh, now I can't even think of it. When wine is grown with a moon cycle. <laughs> Biodynamic. That? Thank you. Biodynamic. Like they might not even know what that means, but it, it's part of the wellness. It's part of well, wellness for the earth. Um, and it's definitely something that's a huge value. And wineries that are they're ignoring the concept of sustainability, is it's going to really bite them later. And the fact that like so many wineries are ignoring alternative packaging, which is huge and selling like gangbusters. Um, you know, some of my favorite brands that are really targeting younger consumers are folks like Nomadica who are putting amazing wines and cans and they're, you know, their four pack, I'm going to get this wrong, but I think it's something like, you know, 30 to $40 for a four pack of canned wine. And it's a, it's a lot of wine or really good box wine is another great brand that has very, very good sourced wine and sustainable packaging. Juliet is another premium that has a beautiful package. So I think, you know, these younger consumers 
really, really value these ideas that you don't have to put everything in heavy glass. You don't have to transport it and use all of the CO2 it takes to create the glass, ship the glass, you know, carry that heavy glass, recycle the glass. Um, those are the wineries that are really beginning to focus on tapping into that younger audience. Yeah, there's Napa and Sonoma have absolutely uh, missed that train. And and I don't know if they can get back on that train. Maybe, you know, in the next five to 10 years, they can. The, the glass packaging has been a challenge over the last three to five years, partly because of the pandemic and the supply chain, but the, the cost of glass has gone sky high. Uh, and then that translates down to the cost of wine. And it's for the limited production wineries of which there's, you know, 90% of them in Napa alone produce under 10,000 cases. So any type of expense increase either hits their bottom line or they have to raise prices. And you talk about alternative packaging just from an ecological perspective, but it also oftentimes is lighter. And so then you have the shipping cost is reduced for the winery. And then it gets back to that experience that we were talking about, because I think there is that familiarity of the bottle of wine, the, yeah. the uncorking and stuff like that. And it's, I don't know if it's a perception piece and I'd love to hear some people uh, comment about if the wine's just as good, I'm more than happy to, to pop a, you know, a pop can tab or a, a twist off or a box wine uh, that they, they don't have to have the glass. And I think if consumers, and maybe they're voting with their feet towards some of these alternative packaging wineries that you reference, but I don't think Napa and Sonoma have gotten the message yet. What are yeah. your thoughts on that? I mean, I definitely think Sonoma is probably more likely to get into that. Mm -hmm. You know, one of our clients is Ron Rubin Winery out of Russian River, and he is one of the only wineries in California that's B Corp certified. I think there's like five. Wow, um, nice. So that's a huge, huge value to them, and they make amazing wine. Um, but so I, I feel like Sonoma is a little more hippie than Napa, in my opinion, um, and they're they're getting with it. Um, but there's also some barriers to entry for smaller producers. You know, like if you're going to have alternative packaging, you need to get a canning line. You need to find something to fill back in a box. There, there are ways that, you know, there are things that kind of prohibit the smaller wineries from getting into it. Um, but I think that I think there's a sea change coming. It's oh, as younger consumers become a larger part of the market share, uh, the industry has no choice but to become more sustainable. And then, you know, that's just, it's bottom line, I think, because people aren't going to keep buying heavy glass. Yeah. And it's funny too, because it used to be, we call them steroidal bottles, because when the winemaker who wants to have his or her wine, usually men, uh, be featured as a thing of prominence, they put it in this extremely heavy glass that yeah. is part bottle, part weapon. And, <laughs> and that's just not environmentally sound. It, it's, it. To your point about the fossil fuels and the carbon emissions, it's, it just takes more to ship that bottle. It takes more to manufacture that bottle. It, it takes more to store that bottle. And all of us that have wine fridges and stuff, you know, those weird shaped bottles actually screw with the whole formation of your shelving unit. And sometimes they don't fit in. And it's, it is a first world problem. I'll be first one to admit <laughs> it uh, from that standpoint. But I think that's fascinating. And, and I do agree with you on the Sonoma seems to be a little bit more early adopters on these sorts of things. And by the way, I referenced that the average tasting fee in Napa in 2022 was $81. The average tasting fee in Sonoma was $31. So I don't know that the tasting experience in Napa, depending upon where you went, was you know two and a half times superior to, to warrant that price. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. What type of experience when you are a wine consumer are you looking for? Me personally? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I mean, I feel like that, like you said earlier, that experience is a million different meanings if it's on premise or off premise, meaning if it's at a restaurant or a bar or at, you know, a way I buy at a store and take home. If I'm at a party, if I'm at a tasting, if I'm having a nice dinner. Um, one of my, honestly, like one of my favorite wine drinking experiences is a can of Trader Joe's crappy rosé <laughs> in my courtyard <laughs> with my kids running around and in summertime because I can have one can of it. You know, and that's something else younger drinkers are craving too, like to not waste an entire bottle. Like old like, millennials are not drinking four glasses of wine in a night by themselves. I'm trying not to tonight. I don't usually <laughs> we'll find out how it goes, um, but millennials- Technically you're not a millennial, so you're fine. That's true, that's true. Um, but they, they want single serve, you know, like a lot of people, especially as older millennials are aging, like you can't have three or four glasses in a night or if you're not sharing it with your friends. So for me, I, I love a single serve wine even if it's not the world's best wine, um, you know, that's, that's part of it. 
I also love a great wine, a great dinner, you know, to me, like having that beautiful bottle of wine, choosing to do bottle service as opposed to ordering by the glass makes a dinner special. And so that's a great experience for me. Um, and my favorite wine experience is drinking Pet Nat in Paris, <laughs> no matter what it is. So <laughs> that's truly, that's the experience that, you know, I define myself as like sitting at my favorite wine bar, Resto Zinc in um, Bastille, drinking a whole bottle of Pet Nat. That's, that's my ideal wine. That's a good experience. I'm a big fan <laughs> of that experience already. Yeah, I think that is going to be an interesting thing. And there's been a ton of activity in the chat with regards to uh, like single serve, smaller bottles, which I'm I'm looking forward to reading some of that later and sending that to you. Yeah. It's it's even our experience, excuse me, while I write my eye, from when I say ours, Mission Control and I, we we do look for everyone at Cellular Angels know we're big into the biodynamic, sustainable, organic. Uh, yeah. Most of the producers that we feature even if they aren't certified CCOF, they're farming organically, but it costs a lot of money, as you know, to get that certification label. And But most of the farmers have just been like, this is the way we've been farming for the last two generations or yeah. three generations. We don't put glyphosate on the crop because that's just dumb. And yeah. so they're into the regenerative standpoint. Uh, and also I do love the canteen component, which is why wine club members, you get a canteen. So you can take that canteen anywhere and it doesn't have to be wine. We know a lot of folks that might have a, a spirit and lemonade in there or something because it, it actually is very versatile. I'm curious how we can get the, the, the alternative packaging to get a winery in Napa and Sonoma to adopt that. Um, most of, and most of the jug wines or the box wines have this negative connotation that it's plunk, that yeah. it's substandard, but yeah. you are here to tell me that you've had some great box wines where that isn't the case. 100%. And it's changing. A lot of them are sourcing from lots of different vineyards, but specifically really good boxed wine is amazing. It is $3 a glass. It is really incredible. High quality wine, Juliet, gorgeous, 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 um, so that's something, you know, I, I think it's happening. I also think one of the perception too, is that wine won't keep, right? If you're in like a Mylar or, Ly or PVC, whatever that, right. forgive me, whatever the liner is, um, that wine won't keep. Um, there's a new bottle out of England called the Frugal Pack bottle. And it's a paper wine bottle that has a wine in a bag in a box sleeve inside of it with a screw cap. Um, and they have proven their wines up to three years of being 100% exactly the same. So I think if anyone's going to adopt, it's probably more for whites, rosés, sure. not meant to age. And I'm not suggesting Opus One puts everything in a bag in a box. Like that's crazy. Like there's a luxury component to this, these experiences. And as a packaging designer, you see a lot of glass behind me. Like I'm not anti-glass, um, but if we're talking about the future and connecting with younger consumers. It's a huge element of what needs to happen in, in the industry. So and it's interesting you talk about brand and I'll reference Judd Wallenbrock on who was on two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And the topic was how to run a winery because Judd has run five of them, including uh, Krug. He worked at Opus for a number of years, has his own brand. But I think you would love his philosophy because it seems to parallel yours in that when he walks into a winery, he needs to know within 30 seconds, what is the brand of this winery? Yeah, And I need to be able to discern that from the decor, the way I'm greeted, uh, how the tasting sheets are laid out, that type of stuff. And all of that speaks to the experience that the individual is going to have. Yeah. With your business and your work, is that some of the things that you work with uh, a producer on and, and all of that aspect and building their brand? Yeah, 100%. So we we began, like before we even put pen to pixel, as I say, on label, logo, website, package, we spend weeks and weeks and weeks doing a deep dive into their brand strategy, you know, figuring out what is that freedom for Harley Davidson for their winery? What is that emotional connection from the consumer? How are we fitting into their lifestyle? How do we let them check that box that says, that's for me, <laughs> you know? Um, and that doesn't, like when you tell me, oh, loamy soil and dry farmed, like that doesn't tell me it's for me. It tells me about your product, not your brand. And so that's really how you have to think about branding. It's like when you walk into a winery that has your style of interior design, it's playing your kind of music, it has you know people who look like your compatriots are walking around, you're going to say, wow, that's for me. And when you walk in a tank garage in Calistoga and they've got heavy metal planing and it's in a vintage um, old uh, actual garage with like 
old gas tanks that does actually dispense wine, you know, and pinball machines and like it's punk everywhere. Like you walk in that space and for the right people, it feels like home to them. And so making sure we help our wineries think about what is, what is that emotional connection? What are the talking points? And we do talk about the liquid. We talk about what's in the bottle. We talk about your farming practices, you know, the differentiation of your grapes, et cetera. But so many wineries just don't go past that. You know, I, if I hear another winery just saying, oh, for three and a half generations of Napa family, when Napa was settled, we did the thing, you know, like everyone's heard that story over and over and over again, but who is it for? That's, that's where you really make the jump. And so we do a lot of that brand strategy work. We help with our uh, brand point of view. You know, what do you believe in? What are your values? Like, why should someone believe you believe those values? So if you say, you know, we're a winery that's all about sustainability, why, why should I care? Why do I know that you're actually walking the walk and not just telling me it's something that you value? So we do a lot of that work. And then we also help them with all the messaging and helping them put it together. You know, one of my favorite new wines I was mentioning earlier is this winery called Voon. And it's, um, you know, everything is from you know, around Santa Monica kind of type vineyards. And the whole idea of the brand is that it's for everyday eccentrics. It's like, it's elegant, but we don't take ourselves too seriously. It's a little bit quirky. And so then the packaging becomes all this like really quirky, funny, bizarre, but very elegant design. It's that juxtaposition of kind of weirdos. It's like, this is a wine for weirdos who love wine, who geek out on the details, who want to have a, an experience that's educational and know that we can trust them to choose the very best juice for every single wine. Um, that's what we do for our clients. It's that, that whole storytelling. Could a client have too many messages? We try to keep them to four categories of message that everything nests within. We call them their core tenants. So okay. we, we really try to, you know, we do a discovery. We get to know that brand. We primarily only work with founder-driven brands. So almost every winery that we work with has a founder behind it. And even Cooper's Hawk, you know, Tim McHenry still approves every label that we design. Um, but we, we developed four key tenants of that brand. Two of them are usually what you're selling, literally, what is in the bottle. And then the other two are how you make people feel. And then we codify all of it in the North Star, which is really that very, very tippy top feeling or emotion that drives the brand. So for example, if Tiffany's started selling car tires tomorrow, you still know what kind of tires those are because that, that quality of of Tiffany's is so high up here. And that brand is so effusive that you still understand it no matter what's in the bottle. So we try to get our clients out of the product and into that brand philosophy. And I'm, I'm curious when, how, how much resistance do you sometimes run into with the founder who says, well, this is the story we've been telling for three generations here in Napa. And you're like, nope, talk to the hand. I don't want to hear anything about this again. Yeah. I mean, it can be, it can be hard to get people out of quality, family, method, you know, terroir. Like it, it's because mm -hmm. it, that is the standard, but that's why people work with Vent too. So I don't have that hard of a time because there are a lot of design agencies that are all about the status quo. And right. we're, we're outsiders. We're we're from outside the wine industry. You know, we're we're newish in the industry. Um, and so we come with this whole new perspective. And so clients come to us because our, our design and our brands don't look like everyone else's. And because we bring those insights from the broader idea of brand versus just label. So if a, if a winery was going to reach out and contact you and, and say, help us, we need a complete overhaul redesign. Yeah. And it's, it's not a quick process. So when you sit down and meet with them, how much time do you spend doing research on them ahead of time? And then what is two part question? What is kind of the first things you want them to be thinking about as it relates to manifesting the the build, the redesign, the the color palette, all of that? What are some of the things that you tell them? Here's what I want you to. Here's your homework on you know day one. Yeah, almost nothing for both. Good. Okay, <laughs> honestly, because like we we gain our discovery through a ninety minute conversation where an Amanda Wurzbach, our brand strategist, is a gift from God. She is, is, her, is her gift on earth is to meet founders and really dig into those feelings and those unique nuances and those stories that really come to life in our those differentiators. And certainly we do our research and we get to know the winery. We understand what makes them unique and different. But truly, like, there's not a lot of difference in wine. There is. With respect, there is. Right. But there's not. 
you know, like it, it doesn't take, you know, someone else opens another, you know, or, or plants another vineyard at your elevation with your same kind of soil. And, you know, you're now one of two or one of three or one of four. And so it's about story, right? It's all about storytelling. And so a lot of what we do is really just ha- like hone in on that storytelling and that emotional side of things. And we don't make things up. We don't say, oh, this is hip these days. We really dig into like their founder driven story and help mm-hmm. understand like what kind of person does feel comfortable within that story and how do we connect with them? And the second side of telling them like, well, think about these colors and think about those things. We handle all that for them. So it's really painless. Our average branding process is about five hours of time for a winery. It's really not intense. So, because we do this a lot and we understand what it's like to you know extract that conversation, present that big idea, that overall compass, come back to them with messaging in another meeting. And then it's our first presentation for brand and packaging. And they usually can't even decide because they like them all so much. So it's, it's really painless. There's not a lot of work for them to do. Impressive. Impressive. If you were going to give an advice to millennials on how to approach brands, what would that be? Oh man. I mean, I would say live your values. And I, I it would be great if I could say everyone just go, please go check out Napa wineries and spend all this money. Um, but the reality is until millennials reward the wineries that do match their values, who do celebrate diversity, who do celebrate sustainability, who do celebrate accessibility, then no one's going to change. So I would say stay the course, millennials. Like this industry is going to bend to us or break and there's no option. And, and I think in a lot of ways it's, it's right. I personally am on a mission to make the industry more diverse. You know, I mentor through the Roots Fund, which is an organization that is working to make wine more accessible to people of color. You know, we can encourage wineries to become more sustainable. These are things that aren't just like, how do we kowtow to younger people? But it's really where the world needs to go. You know, there's not a lot of wineries where people of color feel welcome. And that's not, you know, a blanket statement. I shouldn't, you know, I'm not trying to apply that to everywhere, but there's not a lot of places where you walk in and say, oh, this is my culture. I get it. You know, or, right. you know, the, I, or, the, or, or more importantly, not a lot of wineries you walk into where you don't think I need to squeeze myself into this culture, you know, or, you know, even myself, you know, I walk in a place, I feel like I have to put on airs, <laughs> you know, yeah. become, become someone new. And so there, there's a whole opportunity and there's a lot of other AVAs that are, are going to pick up the slack for Napa, I think. I agree. It's funny because you don't want to be the square peg trying to fit into a round hole when you walk into an establishment and you look around and you think, oh, I am, I don't fit in here. I mean, there's only been really uh, one place where, where I fit in every single place I went into. Well, unfortunately, it was the country of Ireland, but I can't live there. So other than that, it was it was delightful. Uh, for those of you drinking the Kaluna, I want to show you this winery because it's funny. Scout talked about telling stories. And many of you that have known Cellar Angels over the years you know that we predicated this. I, I, we stole the idea from 60 Minutes. Uh, 60 Minutes was founded 40 plus years ago by four words, tell them a story. And it literally is why we founded Seller Angels in addition to wanting to raise money for some very worthy charitable causes and just make the world a better place. But in telling stories, we love telling the story of Kaluna. Uh, because David Jeffries really is a is a one man wrecking crew as it relates to wanting to produce some of the best wines out of Sonoma possible. Uh, he wasn't looking for the, the estate that he ended up acquiring. Uh, was looking for a couple acres and ended up with I think sixty, and uh, that required additional investment. But you know he is a dream pursuer, so he definitely got his wife Marla involved and went and got out went and got outside investors to be able to make this property a reality. And then he went and studied in France in Bordeaux and still goes over to France once a year uh, to learn what they've been doing for 800 years. And his his property in Sonoma is something to behold. Some of the angels have been there. Uh, They were fortunate enough and we were humble enough to host them at this property. Uh, Mission Control and I have been there a couple of times. I encourage everyone to go. Uh, Here you're looking up Napa Valley and Sonoma right here and you can see the pacific and we talk about the specialness of this land every friday when we are on and it is truly a magical tapestry of unparalleled opportunity from a canvas of winemaking to be able to do what they do here but kaluna is pretty special in sonoma and it is on top of essentially chalk hill and the topography around 
and this is unfortunately because Google snapped this picture, Google Earth, February 25th. So I'm going to call them and see if they can update their photograph. I'm sure they'll take that call uh, because it's much prettier in the summer when the vegetation is in full. And you can see some of the damage from the fires. There's a couple of houses lost over here. This house is now gone uh, and a couple of outbuildings. But the beauty of Kaluna is that David hand harvests and hand grows with a couple of people, all of this. There's no mechanization here. Uh, he produces all five Bordeaux varietals on top of this hill, and it gets fairly windy up here. So you can really appreciate the terrain, the environment, the microclimates. And I encourage you to call David, uh, for those of you drinking the Kaluna, for those of you that were in the wine club, this was a wine club wine. And I will tell you, and Scout has it in her glass, uh, Mission Control and I finished ours, so that was unfortunate. But uh, this has got some Bing cherry on the nose. Thank you, Scout. Uh, cola, dark chocolate. And I know uh, Jeff and Jane, Alyssa, Ivy, there's a couple other folks I can give uh, some tasting notes. Vanilla, coffee bean. This wine, for my dollar, we talk about experience and we talk about not breaking the bank, millennials. I've said this before. This is the best $35 bottle of wine in wine country. I mean, it is absolutely extraordinary. We use $50 a lot in the business as kind of a benchmark of, can you find a $100 bottle of wine that tastes like a hundred bucks, but costs 50? And, and that's our job really, because you can find a hundred dollar bottle of wine blindfolded. You, you don't, it's not hard to find a hundred dollar bottle of wine in Napa. Uh, you could throw a rock and hit a producer, but to find a $50 bottle of wine that tastes like a hundred, that's the gift. And that's the challenge. Uh, this one has, it's, just so full body, wonderful fine grain tannins, uh, but it's uh, its versatility with food is also the experience that you should be after. Great with uh, steaks, great with burgers on the grill, great with uh, brats and stuff like that. I mean, it is just a very versatile food and you're not going to find it in stores. The topography on these slopes is, I've, I've skied slopes that are not as steep as this. And it is a testament to the farming that David brings to the table here. And I'm hoping those that have a sip kit are enjoying it. Um, Scout, what do you think of it? You drink a lot of wine. I think it's great. Yeah. I, and then I was trying to see if they have a breakdown of what's in the, in the glass, but yeah, I love a good Bordeaux blend. It's truly, you know, it has a little bit of jamminess to it, a little bit of like good tannins. I'm here for it. I like that. Um, we talked about brands trying to make the consumer feel that the consumer belongs here. Now, that can be, like you said, hundreds of ways to be able to accomplish that. But if we flip that on its axis, what are some of the things that they unknowingly do that makes the consumer not feel like they belong here? Mm, good point. I think part of it is adhering to the you know, same as it ever was, like same style tasting room, same style label. Like and, there, and there's a as a designer, we have a deference to a certain aesthetic, right? Like if I'm if I'm drinking a wine from Bordeaux, I know the label's gonna look at from Bordeaux. If I'm drinking wine from Alsace, there's like a style of label that goes with that heritage. But I think New World wines have the luxury of being able to step out a little bit from that. But so many wineries just have the same formula of my wine's gonna look expensive if. I have hardly any design, or if I have all centered text down the middle, or it's a cream label, I might get crazy and like notch the corners off the edge of the label. Um, but I really think if you want to connect with younger demographics, having that diversity, having that point of view in your brand, not being afraid to stand out a little bit uh, is so powerful. And, and quite frankly, just cooler to younger people. Mm -hmm. you know, I think there's like, there's gotta be that, mis that, that mystique, that cool factor for brand. Um, and when you, when you are consistently trying to fit within your lane of everyone else, you're losing out. You know, I think in Napa wines, everyone's always talking about Opus one and how like, no, no, they have that cool, like double headed graphic. Ooh, <laughs> like, like this John Legend wine is printed on silver metallic stock is reflective. It's all black and white. It has like a gold foil. It's like a full faced photo. Like there's a lot of personality living within that wine. Um, you know, some of these wines behind us where you are able to tell story through graphics and not just text. So that's well, and it's, recommend. it's funny you talk about Opus because we, uh, I don't know how many weeks back we did the Judgment of Paris and we did a whole expose on that. And Opus came about in 1979, three years after the Judgment of Paris in 1976. 
So that very, very cool avant-garde double-headed label has been around 40 plus years. Yeah. It might've been very cool back in 1979. And now I think it has, a, a you know, it's kind of like Tiffany's box, right? You associate something with yeah. that color, with that box. And, and I don't know if Opus could ever, I mean, they have a second label. I don't know what that label, I can't remember what that label looks like, but you, I think you get pigeonholed or you certainly could. And then it gets harder and harder to go away from that and introduce new things. Would it not? But that's a great point though. Like I feel like a lot of wineries are beginning to stratify their wine. And so you have your reserve level, you have your mid tier, you have more accessible, which might be a different name. Maybe you sell it at total wine. It's not just a tasting room or wine club only kind of release. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, those are other ways you can start offering different design, different brand, more affordable price points and become a little bit more of that retail brand uh, that just allows more people to drink and enjoy your wine, you know, and not having it be exclusively from your allocation or from your wine club. I'm, I'm so impressed with your business, what you do for the wineries, what you do for the labels. I'd be curious, what would your advice be to a small winery that is, does not have a physical location, mm -hmm. which, you know, there's quite a few of those out there that just have a license and they custom crush, they have a bottling line come in, they might yeah. be at a co-op and 99% of their market reach is going to be online. Mm -hmm. what, what is your advice to them on, on how to attract customers and differentiate themselves from the noise? Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. Stand out, have a story, show a little leg, be yourself, inhabit that brand, give people storytelling as part of that brand. Um, you know, like, my, like Voon is a great example of that. Evan is buying grapes from these amazing, amazing vineyards. And he is going out for harvest and he's working with Custom Crush to produce this wine. So like, he's really having this opportunity to, to have a brand though, but he doesn't have a winery, he doesn't have a tasting room. Um, but he has invested with our studio and the time it takes to tell the story, to have a point of view, to have the overall wardrobe that conveys that in the blink of an eye. And so that's, that's what I recommend. Like, even if you're, even if you're small, brand is is such an opportunity to not be penny wise and pound foolish because I am the other side of the looking glass as a studio so much of our work is rebrands and I see the numbers jump I see the the you know overall customer satisfaction jump I see the DTC jump when people have a brand that has that point of view outside of our loamy soil <laughs> you know like right. you, you have to have that that um the wardrobe to fit it I often talk about it's like a custom suit like you're not going to walk into the biggest meeting of your life wearing a Timex you're going to wear the Rolex and you're, you're, yeah. So like having that moment where you really are able to have a wardrobe for your brand that reflects you, that you feel great about, that conveys that in the blink of an eye. That's all so important for DTC and get a killer mailing list. You have to grow well, your mailing list. And I think that gets, that's a great follow-up to the question I was just going to ask or segue because it, to me, it reminds me a little bit of real estate. You have to have curb appeal. But boy, when you get inside the house or when you get inside the brand, you better follow up. You yeah. you better you know make certain that you're on point, your I's are dotted, your T's are crossed, you return emails, you perform high levels of customer service. Do you see that actually harming the wine industry because they may invest a lot in the front end, but then they don't execute on the back end? Yeah, or it tastes bad. You know, it's not great wine. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think we're getting a little bit out of my expertise. So it would just be kind of conjecture from, from then on, but yeah, I mean, I think customer service, like people just expect more, especially from DTC and like, you know, nurturing your, your mailing list, doing things like virtual wine tastings on Friday nights to connect with your <laughs> consumers are a really good idea. <laughs> We think so. And and it's yeah. only been three and a half years, SIP episode 142. And for some unknown reason, my technology is failing me and I have no poll question button in front of me, but mission control to the rescue oh, hey. is going to launch your poll question. There we go. Uh, so this is a single one. If you've been paying attention, there are more millennials than Gen Xers, true or false. We've got to figure out a way to have a second or a third option. Like I arrived late. I wonder why I did. We were gonna give this about seven more seconds. Five, four. Yeah, Ivy Ivy had a good time at Red Car because they had a dog. Uh, yeah. So 
every winery that has a dog immediately moves up a few pegs in Ivy's. Right. Exactly. One of my favorite, so my my personal favorite wine growing region is the North Fork of Long Island, mm. and one of my favorite wineries is called One Woman Winery, and it was literally like an outhouse sized shack in the middle of a vineyard and picnic tables. That's it. Uh, perfect. And All right. So the correct answer is we, we had we had pictures, people. Uh, I'd like everyone to raise their hand who said false. I was I thinking see all false. of you. <laughs> yes, there are more millennials than Gen Xers. Uh, and it's growing because they're living longer than Gen Xers. Uh, but it is a cohort that the wine industry needs to start embracing. And uh, we're quite thankful for Scout after running this business and doing what she does for over 20 years to provide us some insight on how the brands can actually reach out and effectively court the millennials. Uh, it's not as difficult as some people would have you believe, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't say the brands that don't do it will do so at their own peril. And it, it really is that important. And it, we, you know, we say that Seller Angels every single week, we, we produce work and do things in a manner that we care about. And we hope that you will care. And we hope that you will care enough to tell others we think brands should do the same thing. Wineries should do the same thing. You know, do something that you are passionate about. Do it in a manner that is expertise and, for our perspective, luxurious, elegant, easy. Follow up with great customer service. But yes, the juice has to be good. And do not begin any conversations with sandy loam soil. That's, I'm, that's my new, that's <laughs> my new, my new rule. Hello, Scout. Man. It has been fantastic to see you again. Uh, yes. We can't thank you enough for spending your Friday with us. And by the way, those of you that heard the Metro train go by in the background earlier, that <laughs> wasn't just a sound effect. She is really in the Chicago area and the I train's right next door. Truly am. Thank you everyone for tuning in today. I can't wait to actually read the chat. I love how involved and connected everyone in this community is. It's just such an honor to speak with you guys tonight. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Sipsters, you guys know what to do this weekend. Be good to one another. For those of you that are actually getting furloughed on Sunday night, I apologize. Uh, we have some wine for you. Uh, hopefully everything works out in the end. And thank you so much for all your support. Be good. And we yeah. will see you next week. By the way, next week, whew, Mission Control would have killed me. Uh, <laughs> you can find you can find a YouTube video on the channel. Next week is John McConnell, who is the chef at Cliff Winery. So uh, Cliff is obviously very busy. And those of you that know the Cliff Bar, it's the same folks. And uh, many of you have been here, but we're going to be talking about seasonal food pairings. So it is that time of year. I don't have the Halloween decorations up yet like Costco, but uh, seasonal food pairings is something that's always magical every time from a seasonal perspective. We're going to dial it in with the chef from Cliff family. Hope you'll join us. Everyone have a great weekend and Bye. we will see, see you soon. Thanks, Scout. Yeah. Yeah. And then real quick, if I can just share with yes. everyone, um, our website is vent.studio and you're welcome to check out my podcast that is mostly talking a lot about how to connect with younger demographics. We talk to great people and that is a podcast called Vinted by Scout Driscoll. So feel free to check it out. Please do. It's an awesome podcast. Thank you. Thanks I also all. have a great episode with these guys. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Cheers you. everyone. Be good. Bye.